Many adherents of Eastern Quote Orthodoxy base their theology about God on Gregory Palamas. A major focus of Palamite theology and spirituality is the transfiguration event and the light that was shining during that miracle on Mount Tabor. Matthew 17, 2, quote, And he, Jesus, was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light, end quote. Palamas believed that the light which shone from Jesus' face and his garments on Mount Tabor was uncreated, and he condemned those who did not. The, the light of Mount Tabor, when Jesus is deified, is not a created light. This is the argument of the Arians. His belief on this matter was connected to his false mysticism and his entire theology of essence and energies, which is filled with contradictions, heresies, and frankly outright blasphemies and nonsense. Palamism holds that the light of Tabor was not the essence of God, but also not created. It holds that it is an uncreated light and an energy of God. A number of quote orthodox councils in the 14th century adopted Palamism and anathematized anyone who said that the light of Tabor was created. These anathemas are incorporated into the liturgy that is celebrated by modern-day Eastern Orthodox. On the first Sunday of Lent, many, quote, Orthodox read the Synodicon of Orthodoxy. It includes the following condemnations. Anathema, anathema. The chapters against of our Lamina Kindness. To those who sometimes think and say that the light which shone forth from the Lord and his divine transfiguration is an apparition, a creature, and a phantom which appears for an instant and then immediately vanishes, or sometimes think and say that this light is the very essence of God, and thus they dementedly cast themselves into entirely contradictory and impossible positions. In the former case, they rave with Arius' madness and sever the one Godhead and the one God into created and uncreated, and in the latter case, they are entangled in the impiety of the Messalians who assert that the divine essence is visible. To those, therefore, who do not confess in accord with the divinely inspired theologies of the saints and the pious mind of the church that this most divine light is neither a creature nor the essence of God, but uncreated and natural grace, illumination and energy, which everlastingly and inseparably proceeds from the very essence of God, anathema. 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 Well, the very position that they are anathematizing was taught by Pope St. Leo the Great, a man they claim to believe is a saint and a teacher of the true doctrine about Jesus. Before we cover that, here's what the Greek Orthodox liturgy says about Pope St. Leo the Great in a hymn. Quote, Seated on the priestly throne, O great and glorious Leo, with the Holy Trinity's inspired and God-given doctrines, thou didst stop the gaping mouths of spiritual lions, and didst shine upon thy flock the light of God-knowledge, and art glorified now as a divine initiate of the sublime grace of God. End quote. Of Leo the Great, the Bishop of Rome, whose memory we commemorate this day. Tonight, uh, we... As we heard, we celebrate the memory of Leo the Great, uh, the bishop or pope of Rome, uh, who was a, a fifth century saint of our, of our holy church. We have this beautiful shared history uh, and, this, um, and uh, you know, lights of orthodoxy like Leo the Great uh, of Rome. Also note that in his work, The Triads, Gregory Palamas repeatedly claims that all the saints believed that the light of Tabor was divine and uncreated. For example, he says, therefore this light is indeed divine, as all the saints agree, end quote. His statement is false, just like his novel and heretical theology. It's another example of how Palamas frequently perverts the patristic tradition. Pope St. Leo the Great directly contradicts Palamism on both the light of Tabor and the essence of God. What's remarkable about the passages we will cover is the specificity with which Leo the Great speaks about these matters. Palamism wasn't invented until almost 1,000 years after Pope St. Leo the Great. However, in God's providence, Leo the Great happened to speak about the nature of the transfiguration event with remarkable precision, perhaps more precision than any other father on this matter. Also, remember that at the Council of Chalcedon, a council that the Eastern Quote Orthodox claimed to accept, it was stated that Peter has spoken through Leo in regard to Leo's position as successor of St. Peter and the pure and true doctrine that he taught about Christ's two natures in one divine person in his tome to Flavian. Hence, even Eastern Orthodox claimed to believe that Leo the Great had special insights and was used by God to teach on the matter of the two natures of Christ in one divine person. Now in Sermon 51, Leo the Great speaks about the transfiguration. Here's the Latin text from Minya, Latin Fathers, Volume 54, in case anyone wants to consult the original. In this sermon, Leo specifically teaches that the brightness and the glory that Peter, James, and John saw on Mount Tabor was not Jesus' divine nature or uncreated, 
but rather pertained specifically to Jesus' glorified human nature. Leah says, quote, Because although they had understood the majesty of God in him, nevertheless they did not know the power of the body itself by which his divinity was covered. And therefore rightly and significantly he, Jesus, had promised that some of the disciples standing by would not taste death until they should see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That is, in the regal brightness that specifically pertains to the nature of his assumed humanity, and which he wanted to be manifest to these three men. For that ineffable and inaccessible vision of the deity itself, which is reserved to eternal life for the pure in heart, they were in no manner able to gaze on and behold while still clothed in mortal flesh. Therefore the Lord reveals his glory to his chosen witnesses and brightens that form of the body which is common to the rest of men with such splendor that his face was like the flashing of the sun and his clothing like the whiteness of snow. The main reason all this took place in his transfiguration was so that the scandal of the cross would be removed from the hearts of the disciples." End quote. As we can see, Leo clearly teaches that the vision of Jesus on Tabor and the light shining from him was a vision of Jesus' glorified humanity, not his uncreated divinity. Remember, the Palamite Eastern Orthodox anathematized this position as heresy. To those, therefore, who do not confess, in accord with the divinely inspired theologies of the saints and the pious mind of the Church, that this most divine light is neither a creature nor the essence of God, but uncreated and natural grace, illumination, and energy, which everlastingly and inseparably proceeds from the very essence of God, anathema. 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 Note that Leo also teaches the beatific vision by stating that the vision of the deity itself is reserved to eternal life for the pure in heart. We know that Leo is correct about the light of Tabor because scripture tells us that Jesus' face was shining with this light. Gregory Palamas also acknowledges that the light at the transfiguration shone from the face of Jesus, but he doesn't understand the implications of that admission. For example, Palamas says, quote, Certainly this light shone from no source other than the glorified and venerable face and body of Christ, end quote. Well, Jesus' face and body were created, as even the Eastern Orthodox admit. That's a Christian dogma. Since the magnificent brightness was a manner in which Jesus' face and body existed during the Transfiguration, the light was necessarily in his human nature. Even Palamas repeatedly teaches that the light was received in Jesus' human nature and that, in his view, it is given to the human nature of justified souls. For example, he writes, quote, In the future this light will deify manifestly the sons of the resurrection, making them eternal and glorious together with him who has endowed our nature with his divine glory and splendor, end quote. Since the light was in Jesus' human nature slash humanity, it was necessarily created. That's because as the Council of Chalcedon dogmatically teaches, there is no fusion or mixture between the two natures in Christ one person. Rather, as the Council affirms, the property of both natures is preserved in the union of one person, with the difference between the natures at no point taken away through the union. Hence, a human face and body cannot shine with an uncreated splendor or brightness. To state otherwise is to promote the heresy of Eutychianism, that is, to confuse or fuse the two distinct natures in the one person, which is in fact what Palamas repeatedly falls into. The confusion and mixture of the divine and human natures is a heresy that is all over Palamas's horrible writings, and I could give many more examples of it. He seems to be completely oblivious to the Council of Chalcedon's dogmatic definition, which declared that the two natures in Christ are not mixed or fused. Palamas teaches many heresies, but Eutychianism is one of his most prevalent. His error on the nature of the light seen in Jesus' face at the Transfiguration is not his most egregious or obvious heresy, but it is the jumping-off point for the atrocious theology he invented and for many of his outrageous claims. Indeed, to maintain that the light shining from Jesus' face on Tabor was uncreated is not only a theological error that leads to Eutychianism if fully embraced, but it is to deny the reality of the transfiguration of Jesus' body. Metamorphothē is the Greek word used in Matthew 17:2 for the transfiguration. It means that Jesus' form or figure, of course referring to his external human appearance, was changed, transformed, metamorphosed. Well, a human figure cannot change into an uncreated divine form. That would again be to confuse the natures. But Jesus' typical human figure or appearance can be changed into a glorified human form, which is what happened during the miracle. St. Thomas Aquinas also points out that it was due to a special dispensation that the glory of his soul did not overflow into his body from the first moment of Christ's conception. But Peter, James, and John received a glimpse of his glorified human body during the miracle. To say, as the Pelamites do, that what Peter, James, and John saw was an uncreated divine light that always existed 
is to deny that Jesus' human figure or appearance really changed into another human figure or appearance. It is thus to deny that there really was a transfiguration. This video is not about what all the fathers said with regard to the transfiguration. It's primarily about what Leo the Great and Maximus the Confessor taught. However, I will note that there are other fathers, including Eastern fathers, who indicate that the light witnessed on Tabor was not uncreated, but rather an aspect of Jesus' glorified human form. There are also quotes that Palamites bring forward from saints and fathers as if they favor their view on the vision of the transfiguration, but those quotes are not to the point. They could be understood to refer to the transfiguration miracle revealing the identity of the Son, who is light from light, true God from true God, rather than addressing with specificity the nature of what the apostles saw in Jesus' face and body. In fact, Leo's passage is perhaps the most precise treatment of this matter among all the fathers, and it's notable that he emphasizes that the vision specifically pertains to the nature of his assumed humanity. And of course, no church father taught the outrageously heretical Palamite theology, which is filled with heresies, including the false teaching that posits a real distinction in God between essence and uncreated energies. That false theology also holds that some uncreated things begin to exist, which is heretical anti-Christian nonsense that is contradicted by the councils and fathers. Now, even though the brightness and glory that Peter, James, and John saw on Mount Tabor specifically pertained to Jesus' glorified human nature and therefore was created, as Pope St. Leo the Great correctly teaches, the splendor was, as St. Thomas Aquinas also points out, derived from his Godhead and from his glorified human soul. St. Thomas Aquinas, quote, The brightness of Christ's body in his transfiguration was derived from his Godhead, as Damascene says, and from the glory of his soul, end quote. In conjunction with the voice from the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, Matthew 17, 5, the miraculous brightness and glory that shone forth from Jesus' body during the transfiguration was a revelation about who Jesus is. It revealed to the chosen disciples that within Jesus was a glory that transcended the earth, a glory shining in his body and derived from his divinity through his glorified soul. Jesus will also communicate glory to the bodies of the just in the resurrection, as many saints teach based on Matthew 13:43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Indeed, in St. John of Damascus's homily on the transfiguration, even though there is a focus on the transfiguration as a further revelation of Jesus' divine identity, he emphasizes that the two natures in Christ remain unmixed and unconfused in the sublime union of one person. Quote, For the word became flesh and the flesh became word, even if neither of them departed from its own proper nature. He also says, How can utterly diverse realities that is, the divine and human natures, come together as one and still not depart from the proper structures of their natures. This is the drama of the hypostatic union, end quote. Since Jesus is one divine person, the brightness with which he was shining on Tabor in front of Peter, James, and John was indeed the splendor of God the Son. But it was the splendor of God the Son in his glorified human form. And if you decide to engage in a precise analysis of the face and the light shining in that face on Tabor, it must be held to retain the proper structure of the created and human nature, as Leo the Great correctly teaches. It is not uncreated. Hence, the disastrous error Palamas made, spurred on by false mysticism, was to attribute a quality proper only to the divine nature, namely being uncreated, to what specifically pertains to human nature, that is to Jesus' shining human face. As we've seen, this leads to various heresies and actually idolatry. Also consider what Eastern Father Maximus the Confessor says on this issue. In various passages he teaches, just as Leo the Great did, that the light shining from Jesus' face on Tabor was created. These passages are extremely significant because Maximus the Confessor is one of the Eastern Fathers most frequently cited, or rather abused and misused, by Palamites. Maximus writes, quote, It was through the luminous brightness that shone from the face of the Lord on the mountain that the thrice-blessed apostles, in a manner beyond words and knowledge, were mystically guided to the power and glory of God, which is completely incomprehensible to all beings, and learned that the light that had appeared to their senses was a symbol of the unseen hiddenness of God, end quote. Here Maximus the Confessor teaches that the light which appeared to their senses on the mountain was a symbol of the unseen hiddenness of God, and obviously, therefore, not the uncreated divinity itself. Other passages from Maximus in the same work confirm this meaning. Quote, From the symbols which fall within the range of our senses, our mind takes, to the extent possible for us, and only roughly at that, the likenesses of the knowledge of God. And we say that he is all things insofar as we have come to know him from his creations as their cause. End quote. Note, according to Maximus, symbols that fall within the range of our senses are creations. 
Well, we already saw that the light shining from Jesus' face was, according to the same Maximus in the same work, a symbol that appeared to their senses. It was therefore an aspect of Jesus' created, yet glorified human nature, as Leo the Great teaches. This is further confirmed when Maximus explains how the transfiguration event was a symbol of both the negative and affirmative modes of mystical theology. Maximus teaches that when the apostles were overwhelmed by the vision, analogous to how a ray of light can overwhelm the activity of the eyes, it formed within them an understanding or a knowledge that God's essence, the Godhead, is ineffable. It's beyond comprehension. In that way, the transfiguration event formed within them the negative or first mode of mystical theology, according to Maximus. With regard to the second or affirmative mode of mystical theology, he says this, quote, The second mode is composite and magnificently describes the divine by means of positive affirmations based on its effects, end quote. Note carefully that the second or affirmative mode of mystical theology deals with created effects. He then says, quote, The same light also formed within the apostles the affirmative mode of theology, which is divided into modes concerned with activity or energy, providence, and judgment. The mode concerned with activity or energy is grounded in the beauty and magnificence of creation, and indicates that God is the creator of everything, which is evident in the brightly shining garments of the Lord, which our discourse has already established as signifying the visible objects of creation, end quote. Here, Maximus teaches that the same light, the light that shone from Jesus' face, formed within them the affirmative mode of theology, a mode dealing with effects and the magnificence of creation. His meaning is again clearly that the light is created, not uncreated. He likewise says that the shining garments of the Lord signified the visible objects of creation, which would not be the case if they were shining with uncreated light. Maximus's repeated teaching that the light was a created symbol of the divinity, not the uncreated divinity itself, is totally contrary to, and in fact anathema to, Palamite Eastern Orthodoxy. It really is remarkable that Eastern Father Maximus the Confessor so clearly contradicts, and in fact debunks, the false Palamite theology on their central claim about the light of Tabor. It's another good example of how false their claims are in general. They take advantage of the lack of familiarity their listeners have with these deeper matters of theology and history, leading them into a false religion with false claims about the Fathers and the Church. Also note that Maximus says the mode concerned with activity or energy is grounded in creation. That's because in many contexts, when the fathers refer to energies, they are referring to the created effects of God's activity. Those effects, which are plural, tell us something about what God truly has and what he truly is, such as good, powerful, wise, etc. But those effects or energies do not define his essence in a comprehensive or perfect way. Yet so many Palamite heretics misunderstand and misuse references to energies among the fathers. Hence, there is a real distinction between God's essence and his energies when energies are understood as referring to created effects of his activity, but there is no real distinction in God himself between the divine essence and supposedly uncreated energies, as the Palamites heretically say. Now, here is another passage of Pope St. Leo the Great that deals with divine simplicity. In it, he teaches that all the attributes predicated of God are in him the divine essence. This also directly contradicts the Eastern Orthodox Palamite heresy, which holds that in God the divine essence is not the attributes or the energies. Leo the Great, letter 15, quote, For that which is predicated of him is what he himself is, nor is that different from what the Son and the Holy Spirit are. And apart from this one consubstantial, eternal, and unchangeable deity, there is nothing in all creation that is not in its origin created from nothing. No man is truth, no man is wisdom, no man is justice, but many are partakers in truth, wisdom, and justice. Yet God alone is in need of no participation. Whatever is in any way worthily predicated of him is not a quality, but his essence. For nothing is added to the unchangeable one, nothing is lost, because an existence that is eternal is his particular property. Wherefore, while remaining in himself, he renews all things and receives nothing that he himself has not given. End quote. As we can see, Leo teaches that every attribute predicated of God is in him really his essence. This is the true doctrine of the Christian Church, which was also formally affirmed in the letters of Pope St. Agatho, dogmatically confirmed by the Third Council of Constantinople, as we prove in our videos. Leo's statement is directly contrary to the Palamite heresy, which contradicts divine simplicity. For those who don't know, divine simplicity refers to the truth that God is not in any way composite or composed of parts. It is a dogma of the Christian Church, taught by the Fathers and affirmed by the Councils. Leo correctly teaches that this truth about the divine essence follows from the fact that God is in need of no participation. If in God goodness or power or another attribute were really distinct from the divine essence, as the Pelamites say, then only the composite of essence plus goodness or essence plus power would be God. But that's heretical. God is simple and needs no participation, 
as Cyril's third letter to Nestorius, approved by Ephesus, also teaches. That's why God is said to be his attributes. He's said to be love, wisdom, power, etc. Third letter of Cyril to Nestorius, quote, But we do not say this as if the Spirit is wise and powerful through some sharing with another, for he is all perfect and in need of no good thing. Since therefore he is the Spirit of the power and wisdom of the Father, that is, of the Son, he is himself evidently wisdom and power, end quote. As we can see, God is his attributes. Now, in the following quote, Gregory Palamas emphatically denies that God's attributes are his essence, and in his ignorance and blindness insults true Christians like Leo the Great and the Third Council of Constantinople, who taught this Christian dogma. Palamas says, quote, No intelligent man would say that the essential goodness in life are the superessential essence of God. The essential characteristic is not the essence which possesses the essential characteristics, end quote. That is false, as we've shown. Palamas also teaches the heresy that God is composite when he declares that the divine essence gathers the power slash attributes into unity. He writes, As to the superessential, that is the reality which possesses these powers and gathers them into unity in itself, end quote. That is to teach the heresy that God is composite because it means that the divine powers or attributes are not the one God in themselves, but are only made to be one in God by another reality that unites them, namely the divine essence. But what is united to one thing by another reality, and isn't that one thing in itself, is a component or a part of that other thing. Palamas's doctrine here would mean that God is a composite of essence and energies, which is heresy. We could give many other examples of Palamas teaching various heresies and the heresy that God is composite. What Leo the Great teaches here about how everything predicated of God is in him, the divine essence, is exactly what St. Thomas Aquinas and the Church would later teach about divine simplicity. See Pope St. Agatha's letters approved by Constantinople III, etc. It's also interesting that in the 5th century, Leo the Great says that God's particular property is to exist eternally, which is what St. Thomas Aquinas later would describe as God's essence being the same as his existence. That is, God is subsisting existence itself. Also remember that Palamite Eastern Orthodoxy anathematizes this teaching of Leo the Great, a man they claim to venerate as a saint. These facts are just more proof that Eastern Orthodoxy is not the true Christian faith. It rejects the truth about God, among other things. To be a true Christian and be saved, one must be a traditional Catholic. Music